Now, the reason free speech is so important is because liberals and conservatives have to communicate in order to keep society going. And the and it's communication that's central to free speech. You have to be able to talk to each other. Well, and that's what worries me, too, in the era of, of Trump. And I'm thrilled to see leftists losing their minds. I'd lie if I said that weren't the case. But, uh, you know, that's I also because think you're a bad person. It is because I'm a it horrible is, that's person. Why. So uh, that that is it really. Is, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I was worried that that would I was worried that the self-authoring would be boring. Um, and it was fascinating. Do you ever worry, though, because it seems like something that would be so helpful for a lot of people? Now with the recent controversy that some some people who might otherwise be open to the idea of just shutting it down or not wanting to be involved with it because they don't like what you have to say? No, it's exactly the opposite. It's become... It's, the public support for me is probably running at 25 to 1. Sure. Yeah, so, but I mean, so, in academia, right, people who might implement this into their curriculum, I don't, or uh, I don't know, maybe that's not your goal. They have it anyways. Right, so your goal is to go directly to the consumer as it Oh, as absolutely, yeah. 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 We've, I mean, we, we are talking with a variety of different businesses, and some businesses are using it, but, sure. but no, this is direct, and some educational institutions, but no, it's direct to individual. That's the right way to... That seems to be the right way to do it. Yeah, it does. Well, I would imagine that uh, shows like Rogan and, and to its own degree, this show hopefully help with that because having your own reach now is certainly attainable. Yes. Um, people need to understand that this, you know, the nights of 50 million viewers, you know, on three networks are gone. Yes, but they people certainly can are. do really well individually. Um, yeah. You know, we can have a plot of land that we're pretty, pretty happy about. I refer to it kind of as the digital version of the agricultural revolution. Yeah. Or as opposed to the industrial revolution where you have a few people, you know, who ran the networks and everyone worked for them. Now, uh, many people can work for themselves. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. A, yeah, it's a smaller plot of land, but it can be very effective, especially with what, what That's you're not that about. small either. I mean, yeah. your reach is not trivial. Well, I, it's, it's not. It's always, of course, it's, it's less respected because of the likes of Not Gay Jared on this program. So we yeah, well, I think it's, it's a testament to your character that you still employ him. I know. Well, that's the whole thing. So character does matter. And so you are, um, I'm not mischaracterizing you by saying a, a Christian. What would well, be? that's a complicated question, but we'll go with yes. Okay. Well, okay. well, first, let's go, why is that a complicated question? Well, because I've been studying religious belief for a very long time, and one of the problems with, I would say, with modern Christianity, and this is a terrible overgeneralization, is that the, the Christians haven't done a very good job of separating their claims from scientific claims. Right. And that's particularly true on the fundamentalist Protestant side of the distribution. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason there is that it's not obvious to people that there, are more, that there can be more than one type of truth. And what... My, my understanding is that religious truth is fundamentally behavioral truth. It's truth to act out. And that, that doesn't make it less true. In fact, in some sense, it makes it more true. Mm -hmm. um, this is a philosophical issue that we can't discuss because it's too time consuming. But roughly speaking, there's two things that people need to know. They need to know what the world's made of, and they need to know how to act in it. Mm -hmm. and proper religious doctrines are about how to act in the world. They're about the world as a place of action. And the world is a place of action. Right. And religious stories lay out the structure of the world as a place of action. Yeah. And then they tell you how to act in it. And, and there are reasons for that. And so... Well, you know, I find that interesting because I was talking about this with... Um Gosh, I don't know who I was talking with this about, but uh, this idea, you know, the, the Christian idea of sort of complementarianism, that male, uh, male and females have different biological uh, mm. contributions to make, that they have different brains, they are developed differently, mm. they have uh, different driving factors, um, is something that's sort of being caught up to with a lot of this anti-social justice leftism, um, anti-feminism that I, I don't think was really discussed for a long time. I think you see a lot of women who've rejected this blurring of gender lines going, you know what, yeah, I think I think we realize now that, uh, as you said, there's a, there's an academic gap uh, for men. Well, if you look at the way we tailor education, it's not tailored to males, and that's because males tend to learn in a different environment. Public education, certainly in the United States, is entirely tailored to the female brain, to the way they learn in an environment, sitting, very, very vocal, very communicative. Um, it's interesting that there are some, like you said, behavioral sort of truths or how to act in it that people can find. Well, not so, just so with regards to belief, you know, it, it, it's to me, you determine what someone believes not by listening to what they say they believe, because that's actually their representation of what they believe. And that right. might be true and it might not be because lots of people don't act out what they say. Right. And so when you assess someone, at the deepest possible level, you look at what they do, and that's the best indicator of what they believe. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a different way of looking at belief, because we tend to think about belief as, a, as something that's associated with a set of facts. Yeah. But that's a scientific viewpoint. 
Now, religious systems like Judaism and Christianity were established far before human beings had a scientific viewpoint. Mm -hmm. They weren't scientific to begin with, and they're not scientific now. Science wasn't really invented, all things considered, until 500 years ago. Right. And so, the, the, now, it's not that easy to understand that there can be different forms of truth for different purposes. And I'm not making a moral relativism claim. It's a very difficult thing to get straight. But a lot of the apparent tension between religious belief and scientific belief falls away when you start to understand that moral, moral doctrines, which is what religious systems are, mm -hmm. are about how you interact with one another and how you conduct yourself. And the guidelines in Christianity, for example, are very sophisticated. They're very sophisticated. And I'm speaking about that as, uh, as someone who knows a fair bit about psychological theories in general. Sure. And, and the, even the more profound clinical theories, like Roger's theory of, of, of personal development, is very, very heavily influenced by Christianity. Oh, they're all very heavily influenced by Christianity. And there's the central doctrine of Christianity, roughly speaking, is that to put it very briefly, is that life is difficult and there's a lot of suffering and pain in it and that can warp and corrupt you and it, it can make you murderous, it can make you genocidal this, because the suffering can become unbearable and turn mm -hmm. you against life itself. Could make you a Scientologist. Well, even, that, that's, I wasn't even going to go there. I, I know, I'm I wasn't, sorry. Yeah, that, but I, I, that, I crossed the line so yes, you don't Yes, you to. did, you did, you did, you crossed the line. And the essential idea in Christianity, in my opinion, is that the best antidote to suffering is truth, is yeah. to speak the truth and to live your life that way and to act in the manner that you speak sure. and that that's your fundamental moral obligation. And I do believe that that idea is the cornerstone of Western civilization. Well, let me, speaking of Western civilization, to kind of wrap this all up in a bow, what do you think is going to happen? You, you obviously, you're, you're pro-free speech, you're anti-safe space, trigger warning, and it's all sort of stemmed from the gender pronoun issue. Where you, in a nutshell, you said... I'm just, that's I'm what brought all the game. attention yeah, to this. Yeah, that's what brought yes. all the attention. And obviously, I have much more to say, and we'd love to have you back to say more. But since that is such a hot-button issue right now, we've talked about that, my producer, not Gay Jared, and, and uh, Jordan, who's in here, they've gone so far so quickly. Yeah. It was like, when we have same-sex marriage, what do we do? I don't know. Where do trannies take a dump? And let's make that the next civil rights movement. Do you think there's going to be, being a sort of understanding, I guess, consumerist behavior or, or uh, sociology, do you think there's going to be a rejection of it and people are just going to, it's going to go too far and, and well, people I think, will go back I to think traditional? The simplest, I think the simplest outcome is increasing polarization and misunderstanding. That's, That's the point. most likely outcome because it, the stupidest, easiest outcome is the one that's most likely. Right? Because you don't have to do anything and you can be clueless now and you'll get that. Now look a Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's the inevitable you're a outcome. Christ, you're a Christian Nolan fan. <laughs> Christopher Nolan. Not good it'll get me if I don't get that right. So. Well, so hopefully there's an alternative. And I think the alternative, I believe, and I've, I've believed this for a very long time, is that the alternative is for people to learn about their civilization, to incorporate its proper doctrines into their behavior, and to grow up and live properly, mm -hmm. carefully, awake, and to speak carefully, to act carefully, and that I believe that if enough people do that, then we'll avoid the polarization. That's, that's the inevitable consequence, because the problem is, is that people who are characterologically weak, and, and I don't mean this in a judgmental sense, I mean weak in that they can't withstand the onslaught of life, and, mm -hmm. and, and they get hurt because of it. They turn to nihilism or they turn to ideology, and, and when they do those things, polarize. Even if they turn to ideology, it's, it's a toss-up, whether it's the radical right or the radical left, it depends on their character. Yeah. And then that, and that, that requires very little effort on people's part. You can learn the rules to those games very rapidly. And then people polarize, and then they have someone to hate, and they don't have to take any responsibility. And it, you know, what's, what's sort of funny about that statement is I, I have no problem with people having an ideological bias. I have no problem with people seeing the world through a prism. I think we all do. My thing is, if you're left or you're right, just don't lie to me. But ironically enough, we were probably one of the most balanced shows on the primaries and on Trump. And I, mm -hmm. I can't stand Hillary Clinton. I couldn't stand the left. But I certainly would criticize Trump where I thought it was mm -hmm. fair. And that would infuriate people. But I have no problem saying I am a conservative. I look, look. through the world through that lens. Um, one and I of think the that things, allows me to be somewhat objective because I'm aware of uh, Yes, of well, viewpoint. that's about the best you can do. I mean, one of the things that our, our research and other people's research has indicated that is that conservatives are conservative and liberals liberal because of their temperaments. It's partly biological. Hmm. So, for example, conservatives tend to be higher in conscientiousness, which is industriousness and orderliness, particularly orderliness, and lower in openness. Does that sound like someone? 
So, and, and God so, crucified him for not putting things away properly. Aha, uh-huh, aha. Uh-huh. Well, and the orderliness seems to be the thing that's, that's driving things on the conscientiousness side. And so right. what that means is that conservatives, roughly speaking, make better managers and administrators. Mm-hmm. Okay, now liberals are higher in openness, which is both interest in ideas and interest in aesthetics, and they're lower in conscientiousness. And so, and one of the consequences of that is that they tend to make better entrepreneurs and artists. And so our society is basically set up, and this is something people really need to think about, is that... But that's, the, that's odd, because nearly all business owners tend to be more conservative. Not the entrepreneurs. Go to Silicon Valley. Well, come on, you're talking about a limited amount of people, and Steve Jobs beats the shit out of his kids. <laughs> well, we... Look, I, I, I work... I, I do consulting work for this company called the Founder Institute, and we've tested 40,000 would-be entrepreneurs from all over the world, 165 different cities. Mm-hmm. It's the biggest early-stage tech incubator in the world now. Uh, the guy who runs it, Adeo Resi, has created 2,500 new businesses in four years doing wow. this. And we know what predicts entrepreneurial ability. And the, 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 so the liberals are really interested in how ideas relate to one another, and they like to jump from one thing to another. And it does make them more creative, but they're not very good at implementation. Whereas the conservatives are very good at implementation and at detail. And so roughly speaking, the conservatives need the liberals to start companies and to generate new ideas, even though a lot of those ideas are going to be bad. Right. Okay, but the liberals need the conservatives to run the damn companies. Now, hmm. you can be temperamentally conservative and temperamentally liberal. And, and those are valid viewpoints because there's a place for those viewpoints in the world. They can function as tools. But what you have to do is exactly what you just said. If you're a conservative, you need to listen to the liberals because they right. have some things to tell you. And the liberals, and I think they're far worse at this at the moment, by the way, the liberals have to learn to con- listen to the conservatives because the conservatives hold things together and stabilize things. Right. Yeah, well, so the dialogue. Now, the reason free speech is so important is because liberals and conservatives have to communicate in order to keep society going. And, the, and it's communication that's central to free speech. You have to be able to talk to each other or you separate into armed camps and... You either one becomes the other's slave, one becomes a tyrant, right. or there's conflict. Well, and that's what worries me, too, in the era of, of Trump. And I'm thrilled to see leftists losing their minds. I'd lie if I said that weren't the case. But, uh, you know, that's I also think it's because you're a bad person. It is because I'm a it horrible is, that's person. Why. Yes. And, you know, we always, when we when the election night came around, we kind of voted state Republican ticket and held our nose. I think I think everyone at Lauder was Crowder did, um, with a few exceptions. But it is... Uh, I still want to be able to criticize him without people going absolutely ballistic. And I see that for the first time being bred on the right, so to speak. I don't think these people are conservative. But on the left, it was well known that they couldn't handle criticism. You had to follow lockstep. It was a very narrow tent. The Republican Party was a very wide tent. And now in the era of Trump, people get so personal and vindictive if you just say, you know what, I I don't support a 35 percent tariff on companies having to outsource jobs to remain uh, remain afloat. And they get furious. So I don't know if you noticed that in, in Canada, but certainly in the States for the first time, that sort of dogmatic anti-critical um, speak of their preferred leader. Yeah, well, that's, that's part new. of the polarization process, right? Well, I think media is largely responsible. We, we talked about this, the, and then all of a sudden New York Times and everyone were talking about this. Let me present to you two worlds as the, the layman that I am. Mom joins Facebook. She's pro-Trump. Daughter jo- joins Facebook, YouTube. She's pro-Hillary, right? Oh, Donald Trump's going to be a great president. Like... Donald Trump has brilliant cabinet appointments, like the daughter. Donald Trump doesn't release his tax returns, like Donald Trump is a rapist, like. So you go six months and you've liked these pages and you've consumed information that way. Well, the Facebook algorithm, the YouTube algorithm, it's not, hey, you might really need to hear, it's you might also like, to the point where people entirely consume information that is nothing but confirmation bias. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, and I yeah, wouldn't well, even- See, what happens then is that amplifies their temperamental proclivities. Right. And we, we have research showing this too. So conservatives do tend to 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 consume media that that fosters a conservative viewpoint, and right. so do liberals. And so one of the ways, I mean, this was the whole purpose of education at one point is to <laughs> yes, was one, to expose you it was expose you to views that contradicted your own, and to help you find value in those alternative views. Yeah. And so and the reason for that was to help you get out of your confirmation bias and the tendency of that to auger you into a narrow viewpoint that is no longer representative of the world. Right. It's really a bad thing when that happens. It's like it's like you're a celebrity that's completely surrounded by sycophants who only tell you what you want to hear. Exactly. What happens is that because you're not getting any corrective information anymore, your weaknesses don't get corrected and they start to take you over. 
Right. And, and that's, I, that's exactly what's happening in our polarized political landscape. It's like the weaknesses of the radical left viewpoint are starting to predominate to, to dominate the entire spectrum on the left side of the... Yeah, I think, well, uh, I think uh, it's already dominated the left for a long time, and now, unfortunately, I see it permeating the right a little bit, where they're willing to cannibalize themselves just because you're critical of one action of Trump. And that mm -hmm. really worries me in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah, you know, well, the thing about criticism is, for a political leader, is that criticism can be a really good thing, because if you're a good critic, you don't only say why the person is wrong, you offer some alternatives that might be better, and you right. force them to sharpen their arguments. And criti people think of criticism as insult something like that and that criticism is here's a way that you could have done that better right and th you want that you, you you want criticism from other people i mean it's, i think it's hard. you do and i think i do and what's what's sort of ironic in all of this is that we've we used to say the fringe sort of your left my right the fringe left their left so don't that's okay i know you're i know you're a very educated man i'm, I'm doing it for them your left my right and then the fringe my left your right but really, that's mainstream left and right now. They aren't fringe, and it seems like in the middle is what would once have been called the fringe. I don't consider myself a moderate, but I find much more common ground with you than I do many Republicans, certainly nearly all liberals, in just being a critical thinker. That seems like we're a shrinking minority to the point where we would really be considered more fringe than someone with a Trump sign and a funny hat or a social justice warrior who has a snowflake t-shirt and is crying in the corner. Well, that's a consequence of polarization, yeah. right? Because when things polarize, then viewpoints become increasingly black and white, and they become Become increasingly simple and the problem with that like I think it was Einstein who said that an explanation should be as simple as possible but no simpler and political beliefs should be like that too they should be simple as possible but no simpler and the thing about political beliefs is they're not beliefs about statements of fact about the world they're beliefs about how to move forward and right. to solve problems and the the real test of a political belief is can it specify a problem and then can it solve the problem? And the way that we practice those political beliefs and their formulation is through, is through dialogue and, and, and critical dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the critical dialogue is, well, here we've got a bad representation of this. You have a bad representation of it, a poor representation, and so do I. So let's keep, that's what we're doing right now. Right. Let's keep talking about it until our model of the problem is more and more and more detailed. And then maybe we can start to generate some solutions. And then maybe we can start to agree on those solutions and implement them and test them. Well, I don't know exactly uh, what problem it is, but uh, your Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, is certainly a model of some deeply rooted problem in Canada, and uh, I hope you guys fix it. Uh, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson videos, at Jordan B. Peterson on Twitter, and the Future Authoring Program. What's that yeah, website? At, it's at selfauthoring.com. Selfauthoring.com. Yeah. I thought I had that right. I did not. Mr. Peterson, please come back with us. Thanks for the interview. You didn't say yes. Does that mean you're not coming back? Yes. It remains to be seen. This always happens. Lotter with Crowder, stay tuned or don't. He won't. I'd be happy to come back. You can click subscribe below. Do da, do da. If you don't, I'll raid your house. Just click subscribe. That's about as good as I get musically. It's not a music channel. I don't know what to tell you. If you don't subscribe, I will find you and I'll sing to you personally. <laughs>